This is where I ended up in 1980, after coming up from the Crumlin Road, after getting sentencing. We brought the H4. Yeah, so Once we got brought in here, ended up over in the, the class office, where the PO was there, and about four or five prison officers. Told what was going to happen if I didn't wear prison garb and all this, so... Afterwards, after refusing to wear the prison garb, it was brought down on the H, H4A wing, or sorry, it was D wing over this side, where it was put in a cell. See, when you first come on these wings, you'd have been brought into cell 26. Well, it seems to have changed a bit. This would have been cell 26 here. This here's a canteen. So it hasn't really changed much. I've got a partition up at this side. When we come in, we didn't use a canteen because we actually had to eat our food all in the cells because it was a 24 hour lockup. There wouldn't have been any exercise. So it was a question of breakfast, lunch, and dinner taken in the cell. And the orderlies thought that uh, they wanted to mess about with your food, nothing you could do about it. What you used to try to do was one big dinner, one small dinner. So to try to get the two cellmates fighting over the dinner. But the way around that, we used to just share everything in half. If somebody had less of a meal, you give them a quarter of yours, make it the same difference up, so everyone got the same. This was, used to be cell 26, where they brought you in, your clothes would have been lined up around the side of the wall in boxes. This was the prison uniform that they tried to get you to wear. But if you wanted a visit, which was one a month, you had to come in and put the prison uniform on you. And when you get in, everyone was assigned their own box with their name on it. And if the prison orderlies had I wanted to wear the clothes, run about it on their wear, Instead of throwing them to the laundry, they went back into your box. So, go down to visit, you'd have put the same one on or you had to forfeit your visit. So, this is, this is cell 26, that must have been the hobbies. Don't change much, eh? Funny enough, I used to find myself in cell 22. Most of the times I was moved at blocks. Every time we got shifted from one block to another. The first time I came on to the wing, would have been up at the, up at the grills there. I was stood against the wall naked for, must have been at least 20 minutes. Until they decided to bring me in the 26 for the mirror search, and then I was put in one of the cells that was already, somebody else had dirtied up. The only comfort that you had was, some of my guys would shout out the doors that you knew. And it was a bit of comfort coming in, but apart from that, once you get on the cell, that was it. 
you were left to your own devices, but until then, you were expecting the worst all the time, until you were locked in this cell. I suppose that's about it for I mean, what you could say out there. Huh? Most of the day you would just sleep. It's mostly at night when the screws were off duty. That's when the wind came to life. Where you had guys, you had competitions out the door, you had singing out the door. The competition of it was a wing facing you, singing competition. During the day, you mostly slept most of the day, but uh, you woke for food or whatever. Slept out first thing in the morning, had your breakfast in the cell. Then you'd go to sleep again, maybe just before lunch, and the wing would come a bit more livelier. You might have a chess game on the wall where you used to use a wee bit of lead from your zip of the prison clothes that you wore coming in. You would take the zip off and it would act as a bit of lead so you could draw over the wall. You might have a chess game by your, your next door selling it. But apart from that, that was it until night came. That's when it came to life. You would shout over till H5. You'd get everybody up at the windows and shout at the same time, H5. You'd get a reply from H5. Then you'd give the block news. Anybody that was, went under their block, vice versa, anything we heard, we would shout over to them. Then if anybody had a visit that day, they would get up the door, tell them any outside news, what their families heard, what were told the visits. If they seen somebody from an other block, any your news from Matt Black, that's how the news got about. There's one block had a radio smuggled in, so you could hear the outside news. They would shout it over from the art block to this block. Just kept you in, a, kept you in a contact with the outside world. There was no newspapers or anything else, that was it. No TVs, no radios. So it was your lifeline the outside world. Prison chaplain at that time was a father toner, and you couldn't. He was asked to visit the cells, the people was bedding, showing bruises, showing us, but nothing ever seemed to come off it. There was nobody to complain till, nothing at all. No relationship whatsoever. You didn't speak to him unless you had to ask for something, which you probably never got. Even getting the toilet roll off him was a, it was up to them, so I decided they wanted to give you it, or they didn't want to give you it. The only real time you contact with them is in the wing shifts. And that's probably most time everybody was at edge because everyone, everyone was expecting some sort of, say, brutality, whatever. You always expected it in wing shifts. I remember looking out the side of one of the doors and there was a guy in the wing was on the blanket for it then. It was from five years. And I could see the fear in his face because he was walking up the wing, so I said to myself, I'm only here a lot of months, and look at that guy. That was a wee bit frightening at the time, I couldn't see that. Wing ships was a thing that I didn't really understand when I came. I was here about two to three weeks, and I'd heard one speaking about wing ships, but I thought it was only a question of, right, everybody over there or wing. Wasn't that at all. What happened was, you had three blocks here, you had four blocks, three blocks was full of prisoners. They kept one block, one wing empty, so they could power hose it clean. So it meant it was rotation. So every three weeks or so, you were put into a clean wing. But the whole thing, they used it as a psychological instrument as well to break people. And part of it was, you were single one at a time, had to walk up this corridor, which at the top end was lined with screws. And everybody knew the record and violence and brutality in this place. So they brought you up the circle, 
put you over a mirror search. And the thing with mirror search was, we were told, passive resistance, you stood over the mirror, when they said squat, don't squat. But they put their hand on your shoulder, you squat. But when they said you squat, and you stood waiting on the hand on your shoulder, you got to punch the back of the head, dig in the ribs. That was your call in, squat. You squatted over it. But when you went into cells, you would have got orderlies, and they would be going about, instead of setting the stuff in the cell, if you, you were in this, a complete empty cell for about 15 minutes, 20 minutes, they'd come in and throw the pots at you. They'd come in, throw your gear in. And it wasn't clean gear, it was the gear out of the other cells that you just left. So you could have ended up with some of these mattress that was down the wing, or some of these pallet had a hole in it, and there was foam coming out everywhere, and it was just the end of your cell. Chains came when we started getting our own clothes on. Then they allowed you an Irish exercise. You could use a canteen. You were allowed to shower a week. You could get washed in the morning, you could slap out your cell twice a day. Hygiene wise, that was a that was a change. Getting clothes on sort of gave you your own individuality at back, which you hadn't got. There's no football, no facilities for anything else. We used to roll sacks up. Have a game of football if you could. But that was it. Uh, no, like, there was nothing really. More. You got newspapers. Newspapers come in. They brought a prison library around, if you could call it that. But sure, it was something to... It was something to take them to that area to sell. They still weren't out radios or anything like that. This here was a canteen. This was a canteen you, that you would have had mass in. You would have had the priest stand up at the end here. There was no furniture in it, no chairs, no tables, no nothing. The lads used to just sit down on the ground and the priest had mass. And at that time, it was a good time to get talking to some of your friends that might have been over from an oil wing because they would have put the wings together. If there was a wing facing you, they would have joined the two for mass, so you had a good chance of talking to somebody you hadn't seen in a lot of years. And it's also good for communication as well. Well, the only things the lads would have wore over was a pair of prison trousers, so you'd have been in your bare feet, no top. Most of the lads was on it for years, had very long beard, long hair, and the smell was, was rank. To be honest, the smell of lads were very bad. We could see that the, the morale was still pretty high when I first came up anyway. The morale of some of the lads was very good. That's all you could say about this, isn't it? Wasn't a lot of years later that when Republicans started to take control of their own wings, it meant you could walk these, you could go in the canteen if you wanted, go in to, in to do training if you wanted, they installed these weight machines. You could go out the yard for an hour. You'd sit in any one cell that you wanted to sit in. But that, all I'd had to be fought for. It wasn't just, uh, there was, these things were, they were unwritten. There was nothing wrote down saying that you could do this here. It was hard fought for by the guys in the wings. It was a total change from the way it was at the very start. Mm -hmm.